welcome uh, to this, uh, this short presentation about some themes in Athenian democracy. What I want to do with this video is give you an impression of a democracy, the ancient Athenian democracy of the 5th and 4th century BCE, which was quite different from our own and it, which is different in many respects. So I hope what this can do, rather than confirm some of the prejudices we have about what democracy is, will help people problematize a bit how we engage with democratic institutions, what we expect from them, um, what we think, in fact, democracy is. So let's dive right in. And uh, what I want to discuss, first of all, is uh, something quite obvious, something that everybody knows. So Athens, ancient Athens, was the prototypical direct and participative democracy. Uh, it was direct because there were no straightforward representative bodies, meaning that laws, decrees, any kind of legislation wasn't enacted in Athens by elected representatives of the people, like we do today with elections. Instead, every full right citizen could attend the assembly or could be selected by lot for a variety of offices or for the council, and uh, could make proposal, could uh, talk in the assembly, could vote, of course, but vote directly on each proposal. So there was no mediation, basically. And in this sense, it was a direct democracy. And it was, of course, also a participative democracy, because the whole system depended, to a large extent, uh, on uh, the committed participation of large numbers of citizens, uh, uh, to the institutions of the state. That was fundamental, otherwise the machine wouldn't have worked. Just to give you a sense of what kind of numbers we're talking about here, there were in Athens in the 4th century BC around 30,000 full right citizens, uh, over 6,000 and up to 13,000 met in the assembly four times a month. There were 10 months, so we're talking about at least 40 meetings of the assembly per year with between six and 13,000 people attending every time. The council, that was the body that prepared proposals for the assembly, met every day. And 500 citizens met there, and these were selected by lot every year. And there was, uh, iteration was forbidden, meaning that people could be councillors only for two years and not to, for two successive years which means that there was a lot of exchange, a lot of uh, people changed the people that were in the council. And that meant that a large number of these 30,000 citizens had at one point or other in their lives had to serve in the council. Uh, 6,000 citizens every year wore the judicial oath and served as judges in the law court in panels of between 200 and 500. So even the administration of justice was run directly by the people and not by legal professionals. And of course, uh, for all sorts of administrative and executive roles, what we call magistrates, magistrates or just officers, these were also selected by, the, by and large, uh, by lot, some exceptions, some were elected, but very small number, mainly the military officers were elected. Every, all, all the other officers were selected by lot, and uh, there were hundreds of these. And these also had to be filled by average citizens. So in this respect, it was a participative democracy and it was a direct one because there were no elected representatives. It was just the people working directly. Yet, once we have established this, uh, which is already a point of difference between ancient democracy and uh, our modern democratic systems, what I want to present to yourself tonight, to you tonight is, uh, well, a few other difference, rather remarkable difference in how they conceive of democracy. So let's move a second uh, to um, let's move for a second to what we call today democracy. When we talk about democracy today, we usually talk about what political theorists uh, would describe as a kind of adversarial democracy. And I'm going to read to you a quote by a prominent Harvard political theorist, Jenny Mansbridge. And she writes, the West believes that it invented democracy and, the, and that institutions like parliament, representation and universal adult suffrage are synonymous with democracy itself. 
every American school child, we could say also every British, knows that when you set up a democracy, you elect representatives. In school, the student council, later senators, uh, representatives, councilmen, assemblymen, and aldermen. When you do not agree, you take a vote, and the majority rules. This combination of electoral representation, majority rule, and one citizen, one vote, is democracy. Because this conception of democracy assumes that citizens' interests are in constant conflict, I have called it adversarial democracy. So this is how we see democracy. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, for many years and for a long time, even our reconstructions of Athenian democracy have been conditioned to a large extent by this particular picture. We know that Athenian democracy was direct and we know that it was participative, but we have long assumed that that like modern democracy, it was at least to some extent adversarial. And with this, I mean that we have imagined Athenian democracy as a system in which uh, uh, professional politicians, demagogues and orators uh, were more or less the only one to go to the platform and speak in these big assemblies. And the audience, the demos, uh, had as its only task to listen. And the members of the demos individually made up their mind, choosing between the various options advocated by the orators, and eventually they voted between the various proposals, the various options by the many orators. And these voted, which were disparate, were aggregated into one decision by majority rule. Whoever got 50% of the votes plus one won the day. So that's how, for a long time, we have seen Athenian democracy. Uh, but it's become clearer in recent years, uh, thanks to work done by many ancient historians uh, and also thanks uh, to epigraphical evidence, to the evidence of inscriptions, uh, of decrees preserved on stone that have been studied more extensively and more intensively in recent years. Uh, and this picture is, uh, at least some of us would argue, is to a large extent misguided. The kind of picture that uh, uh, that this combination of direct democracy and adversarial democracy paints uh, is something resembling what we call today uh, a plebiscitary democracy. And with plebiscitary democracy, I mean uh, the kind of democracy that we have seen in recent years gaining a lot of ground uh, with repeated attempts to resort to the direct will of the people through referenda, often the result of popular initiative, which are normally called by right-wing populists on a variety of key issues. Uh, in recent years, these instruments of direct democracy have been applied to policies as varied as whether to permit or ban the construction of minarets, restrictions on migration, the public use of a minority language, the acquisition of agricultural land by foreigners, same-sex marriage, the retroactive imposition of inheritance taxes, and the introduction of a basic income. We have had around Europe and the world referendums, referenda about all of these topics. And the appeal to these of these publicity reforms is connected to the much discussed crisis of legitimacy of modern liberal representative democracy. Now, perhaps the most obvious example of plebiscitary democracy that comes to mind these days is, of course, Brexit. How a massive issues like the membership of the European Union um, of, of the whole of the UK was decided by a yes-no answer to a referendum. And of course, uh, there was no particular debate. There was just a referendum and people had to go directly, direct democracy, and vote for one option or the other with limited information and the like. Regardless of the merit of Brexit as a decision, as a policy decision, many have argued that, that the system was suboptimal, the system in which it was made. Not just because there was not enough information, but also because uh, it reduced uh, what uh, was in fact uh, a choice between a variety of possibilities, remaining in the EU, uh, leaving the EU but remaining in the common market, 
different levels of, of, of ties with the European Union. Well, he reduced it to a yes or no answer a question that eventually left a lot of leeway to decide how he was supposed to go. It was also the kind of decision that basically divided the population in the UK because after the referendum, the UK found itself more divided than ever with two parts that voted yes or no, uh, almost hating each other for years. He left a lot of uncertainty. This would be kind of a textbook case of the problems of plebiscitary democracy, according to many political theorists. Now, what's the alternative then? Did the Athenians really work like this? Was at an, an example of this kind of plebiscitary democracy, direct democracy combined with adversarial democracy? We have started to realize that it probably was not, and they made decisions in a very different way. They made decisions more along the lines of what modern political theorists call deliberative democracy. According to uh, theories of deliberative democracy, the essence of democracy is not in fact counting votes for pre-constituted option according to the majority rule or by negotiation of pre-existing reference. The, found, the foundation of democracy is instead in discussion founded on arguments, deliberation, which includes all relevant subjects or at least all relevant positions for the matter under discussion. There have been numerous practical experiences in recent years uh, of deliberative democracy, and the two principles on which they've been founded has been the practice of confrontation and discussion between rational argument, or one hopes a rational argument, and the inclusion of all the interests and the point of view relevant to the topic under discussion. So deliberative democracy is to an extent thought of as a kind of participative democracy, but its boundaries are more circumscribed and demandingly defined. Uh, deliberative democracy excludes by definition uh, simple pressure of movement, special interests, lobbies, even associations and institutions, and requires an argument that is always aimed at the common good. You do not argue for a constituency, for a group. You argue always for the totality. It also requires the practice of dialogical exchange and confrontation between different points of views. And in an ideal scenario, it tends toward consensus. The end game is not just a majority vote in which whoever gets 50% plus one of the votes wins, the end game is to convince everybody and to find a unitary, a consensual, almost a unanimous decision. So some have argued that Athens looked a bit more like that than like a plebiscitary democracy. And I'll very quickly give you a sample of the arguments that have been brought forward and also a sample of the kind of institutional setup that uh, suggests that this was the model and I'll do it in two stages. First, I'll talk about institutions, about how assembly deliberation was set up, whether it was set up to reach consensus and to, to foster debate of the kind I have discussed. And then I'll talk very for a very short while about behavioral and discursive norms and practices uh, on which legitimacy was founded. So let's start with institutions. And here you have a summary and you can pause the video and read it in more details than I will discuss. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what an assembly looked like, how an assembly worked. So assemblies happen 40 times a year. That sounds like a lot, but it's not enough to govern comprehensively a city like Athens. Uh, so what actually happened was that most matters, all matters in fact, had to be deliberated in Athens in advance in the council that met every day with 500 people. The council made preliminary decisions. They were called probuleumata. And they made preliminary decisions of two kinds. Some of them, when they came to a decision, were what we call closed probuleumata. Basically proposals, proper proposals pre-approved by the council. Some of them instead were just open probuleumata, basically invitations to the assembly to debate and make and come to a decision on something without suggesting something specific. Now, all the closed probuleumata, those that were already formed proposals, were voted on at the beginning of each assembly meeting, one after the other, 
and whatever was an whatever got unan a unanimous vote was enacted without discussion. Basically, the council already discussed. If the Athenians all agreed, then that went through. And a large number of decrees went through that way, unanimously, consensually, that way. If even one person raised a hand against that particular proposal, then the proposal moved to the debate stage of the assembly when people talked. And it went there together with those open probuleumata, open preliminary decisions, which didn't recommend a course of action, but just ask uh, the assembly to debate it and come to a conclusion. So this it was how it started. But the real meat of a meeting was, in fact, uh, at the debate stage. Now, at the debate stage, uh, the most powerful, well, uh, the most important uh, people at the debate stage of the assembly, unlike what many people, many have believed, were not, in fact, the rhetors, the politicians, the speakers. The most important people were magistrates called proedoi. These were basically chairmen of the assembly. Now, what is interesting is that these proedoi were not an elected office. They were selected by lot. There were, ten, there were nine of them. They were selected by lot uh, by the council from members of the council. So they were completely random Athenian and they stayed in office only for one day. They changed every time and every new assembly meeting would be somebody else. This was important because they had enormous amounts of power about in terms of running the debate. And it was the kind of power that the Athenians didn't want anybody to exercise consistently and reliably. Nobody was meant to know in advance that he would be a proedros, so that he would be uncorruptible. It was impossible to corrupt somebody if you didn't know who he was. And also, nobody was meant to do it more than once. So basically, the people that run the assembly were people were just random Athenians selected by lot. Now, the proedros had the jobs of uh, running the agenda of the assembly. Uh, they read all the probuleumata in advance of the Procurotonia, and also they read any amendment or proposals that was brought forward by anybody on the assembly. They were accountable for what they did as Proedri, and people could bring charges against them for malfeasance or for behaving the wrong way. What is interesting about them is that they had uh, a certain level of discretion about what proposals they could put to the vote or they would put to the vote. Basically, they could refuse to put a proposal to the vote, mostly on the grounds that there was no unanimity about it, that obviously it was a divisive proposal. Uh, they also had the power of forcing a speaker to leave the platform. If somebody was saying something that was too unpopular or any way that was dividing and therefore had no chance of uh, garnering enough support to lead towards consensus, they could just tell somebody just to step down. This is not working. These kind of powers uh, meant this kind of, these powers that they had meant that they could actually steer the assembly toward consensus. They could let people speak and speak and speak until some kind of consensus was forming, and they had to understand whether a consensus was forming by listening to the heckling, to the noise that the people made, and also by listening to the many speeches that people made. If people kept advocating for the same thing, that means that a consensus was forming. They had to be very sensitive to the mood of the assembly, in a way. And when they felt that a decision, a solution, was coming and somebody made a proposal that could command consensus, that's when they would decide to put it to the vote. And in most instances, they wouldn't put to the vote alternative proposals. Almost invariably, they would put to the vote only one proposal, the one they thought there was consensus about. That meant that sometimes we have evidence that speakers would have drafted proposals uh, in advance, and yet they chose not to give it to the proedri because they knew they didn't have a chance and the proedri would never put them to the vote. But we also have cases of speakers inside that saw that the debate was going in a particular direction and drafted proposals on the spot in the assembly to present to the proedri, to give to them, for them to put to the vote. So these were very key institutions and they had a lot of power. They were similar in their power to what modern uh, 
deliberative democracy practitioners, uh, and even, for example, uh, what movements like Occupy Wall Street calls uh, facilitators uh, of deliberation. Now, the question, the next question I want to talk about quickly, and this is another area in which we now know much more than we used to know even just a few years ago, thanks to a lot of research on inscriptions, on uh, the epigraphical evidence that has been discovered in Athens, the decrees on stone, is who actually spoke in the assembly and who made proposals in the Athenian assembly. For a long time, conditioned by modern ideas, we have believed that most of the people that made proposals in the assembly were in fact uh, uh, politicians, always the same people and the rich. Now, the evidence shows that this understanding is just wrong. That's not the case. Only 30% of proposers of decrees attested on stone belong to the top 4% of the wealth distribution curve. So only a minority, around 30% of proposers and therefore probably of speakers, uh, that we know had decrees enacted were in fact members of the elite in Athens. We also know that uh, the vast majority of decrees that we have preserved, both on stone and mentioned in the literary evidence, uh, are proposed uh, by people we have never heard of before. And uh, as far as we know, people that only ever proposed one decree. That means that most of the proposals that were enacted in the assembly in this massive forum of 6,000 people didn't come from professional politicians, actually came from random people. They just went to the assembly and spoke. So that was the kind of model. And there is plenty of other evidence that showed that there was wide participation by non-elite and even by citizens coming from the rural deems of Attica, from the very periphery of Attica. They came for the assembly. They spoke when they thought they had something to say. They voted or they heckled when they thought somebody was saying something they agreed with or they didn't agree with. And if they had a contribution to make, they would make a proposal and sometimes they would get something approved. So there were, uh, there were semi-professional politicians in the Athenian Assembly and in Athens, and there were people that did speak more often and made proposals more often, but they were not the people that run the democracy. The vast majority of proposals were made by random people, like people like me and you or anybody else that would perhaps speak once or twice in their life or not very regularly. And I here give you two quotes, uh, one from Plato's Protagoras. And I'll read it out because it's quite interesting. This is, uh, this is, in, this is a, in a dialogue by Plato and he talks about the Athenian assembly and he says, but when they have to deliberate on something connected with the administration of the state, the man who rises to advise them on this may equally be a smith, a shoemaker, a merchant, a sea captain, a rich man, a poor man of good family or of none, and nobody thinks of casting in his teeth as one would in the former case that his attempt to give advice is justified by no instruction obtained in any quarter. Of course, when Plato says this, he doesn't really agree with this. He says it is something bad. He thinks this is a bad thing that everybody can speak in the assembly and everybody feels they have something to say in the assembly, even the showmakers. But that was the reality in the assembly. And Iskinis, in, uh, in a speech... Uh, in which he, in a polemic against Demosthenes, uh, in which he accuses Demosthenes of being almost a professional politician, he says, you criticize me for not coming before the people continually, but at intervals, and you think we won't notice that you are borrowing this requirement not from democracy, but from a different constitution. In oligarchies, it is not the volunteer who speaks, but the man with power, while in democracies, it is the volunteer at the time of his choosing. And speaking at the intervals, that is not every time, all the time, is the mark of a man who engages in politics at the right occasion and when he thinks it's beneficial, while missing not a single day is the mark of a professional and a mercenary. Uh, so these are two interesting quotes that give you an, uh, an idea of what the assembly looked like in Athens and who ran the assembly really. Uh, I'll go quickly through a few other institutions that led to debate geared towards consensus. One of these institutions was a public charge called Grafé Paranomon. 
a public charge for illegality. This was uh, a public action that would go down in court and would be decided in court that is similar to what we call today actions for inconstitutionality. So anybody could bring the charge against any decree or even just any proposals made by anybody in the council or in the assembly on the grounds of being against the law, that is, of being inconstitutional. Uh, if it did, then the particular proposal or decree would be suspended. There would be a trial in the law court judged by the Athenians. And uh, if the proposal was convicted, he could be convicted from any, for, to anything from uh, a fine to atimia, the loss of his citizen rights, all the way to death. What is interesting uh, to us, though, is that this charge could be brought after a meeting and after a proposal had been enacted, but could also be brought in the assembly itself before something was even put to the vote. That is, if somebody made a proposal that was too divisive and too many people felt strongly against it, it was very unlikely that this proposal would ever come to the vote because one of those that disagreed strongly with it would just raise his hand and swear that the proposal was illegal and the proposal would be suspended and out of the table until there was a trial about it. So there was not a chance that somebody could propose something that had only the support of 50% plus one of the Athenians and get it passed and get it voted on. It would probably be blocked before by somebody, if not by the proedrums themselves. So the only way you had a real chance to get something approved in the assembly was to try very hard to convince everybody. That was another institution that really, really demanded people to aim and try to achieve consensus. Uh, and finally, the vote itself. Again, I'll talk very quickly about this, but this is a very interesting point. Uh, the Athenians, by and large, in the assembly, like in the council, that is, when, it when it was a matter of political decision making, they didn't vote by secret ballot, like we do. They voted by show of hands. And the hands weren't even precisely counted. They were vaguely assessed by the proedrory. They would look at the sea of hands and they would decide basically if the proposal was passed or not. They didn't count the hands. Now, what is interesting about the Keirotoni, about the vote by show of hands, uh, uh, is that it was usually only on one proposal and the proedrory would ask for the hands to go up for the eyes and then the hands to go up for the nays. And uh, also, what is interesting is that public show of hands as, as a system of voting is not exactly simultaneous. That is, not everybody actually has to vote at the same time. People can wait a second, can wait a second, look around and get a sense of the kind of support this particular proposal was getting and therefore align themselves. So voting by show of hand, and also, of course, voting by show of hand meant that everybody saw what you voted for, which means that you couldn't vote really selfishly or self-interestedly or immorally because people would have to would ask you, why did you vote like that? And you would have to be able to justify rationally and with an acceptable argument why you voted in a particular way, particularly if you decided to vote against what the vastest majority was voting for. So Keirotonia, vote by show of hands, was a not yet another institutional feature that kind of pushed toward consensus because on the one hand, it encouraged responsible voting. On the other, it applied significant amounts of uh, social pressure for people to conform and to get behind the majority so that the consensus could form and would not be broken just by some loan troublemakers or some, some, some party that was self-interested. So these are just few institutions uh, that uh, give you a sense of how voting in the assembly worked, how debates worked. And the result of this is that while unanimity was not achieved in every case, and we do have one famous example, but only one of a vote split down the middle, the famous vote uh, 
uh, after the Mytilinian debate, as described in Book 3 of Thucydides. That was a famous debate uh, about whether the Athenians should get all the adult males, uh, uh, well, basically everybody, including women and children, uh, that had rebelled against Athens from the island of Mytilene, killed. The Athenians, uh, uh, in this case, the Athenians split around the middle. Uh, on the first day, they voted for, for all the Mytilenians to be killed. On the second day, they revised their opinion, they voted again, and there was a vote split in the middle. But the people thinking that not everybody should be killed prevailed by a small minority. But in all other instances we know of in Athens, in which we actually know how the vote went, we know the vote was unanimous was basically unanimous. So this is an interesting thing that not everybody knows about Athens. When people think about Athens and about direct democracy, they imagine majority rules and people arguing a lot of division. There was a lot of division in the debate, but the system was geared, was, was set up in such a way as to favor, as to foster the creation of some kind of consensus. Um, I am going to sum up very quickly, what this institutional setup and what these, these expectations of consensus meant for the behavior of speakers in the assembly. Uh, so what we can tell from the speeches that we know were delivered from the, in the assembly that we have left, mainly the ones of Demosthenes and some reported by Thucydides, is first of all that speaking in the assembly was not primarily about making proposals. It was rather about contributing to the debate. So of all the extant speeches of Demosthenes, for instance, only one is in fact in support of a specific proposal, while all the others are just general contributions to the debate. The debate had to advance until, until some kind of consensus would emerge. So people wouldn't come to the assembly just to advocate for a specific proposal, but rather they would make speeches to foster a line of thinking, they would make compromises too, and they would try to come to some kind of decision together. Also, the kind of rhetoric exhibited in all extant assembly speeches is invariably of a kind that political theorists call integrative rather than aggregative. That is the kind of rhetoric that tries to get everybody together and make everybody feel like they are part of one big group rather than one meant to create subgroups or coalition big enough to reach 50% plus one of the votes. Because 50% plus one in most instances would not be enough to get something through. So the arguments are invariably formulated in view of what is useful, what is to symphon for the community as a whole and not to uh, attract sectional interest. Uh, that's the only way to go, because if you try to attract only the, the approval of a section of the population, then you won't get a consensus wide enough to get the proposal through. And also, the orators never attempt to set up one group that is the bearers of one particular interest against another group. The, the arguments are always, are always built in such a way as to convince the demos in its entirety. And there is the expectation and the understanding that the demos should be understood as one. It's of course a rhetorical fiction, but it's a rhetorical fiction that wants to be reality. They argue in this way as if the demos was one because they hope and they expect that by the end of the debate, the demos will be one. They will all be agreed on something, whether it's a compromise, whether somebody just decided to drop it for this time and just go with the majority or whatever. But still, the demos is supposed to be won by the end. That's the idea. Uh, another interesting feature, and I won't go long too much about this, but is, uh, is Toribos. So anybody who has any familiarity with Athenian democracy knows that the Athenian demos in the assembly was very loud. People made the speaker know, they made the speakers understand uh, if what they were saying well, wasn't something that demos liked. Or on the other hand, they made it, made, they made it known if they really liked it. The demos, the, even the people that were not speaking in the assembly, uh, 
even the audience, those that were just listening for the, for the vast majority, were not passive in the assembly. They shouted, they expressed approval, they heckled a lot. It was a very vocal place and it could be the kind of place that an experienced speaker would find a bit overwhelming sometimes. But then again, that was the way the Greeks decided in most settings from their, from their local association uh, of the, for the cult of the Mitra or whatever other deity to the professional association of the winemakers. Every group of Greeks and Athenians made decisions virtually in this way. So people were used to it. So people were loud. People participated in the assembly actively and interactively, whether they, they spoke themselves or not. And this was not just about making yourself heard. It was also a key instrument of participation. It was impossible for six to 13,000 Athenians to speak at every meeting, which means that one key way for these people to participate was to noise, to heckling, to shouting, to clapping, all of that. But it was also a key tool to foster consensus because it was very easy for the paragery to get a sense of whether a particular proposal or a particular line of argument that a speaker was uh, putting forward found the approval of vast numbers of the Athenians. If people were heckling and disagreeing, this was a no-go. It was not going to work. It was clear. And the orators themselves were encouraged to take into account the reaction of the demos and to adjust and adapt their rhetorical performance, but also their proposals, their line of argument, what they wanted to get approved on the basis of how the demos was reacting. That was quite clear. So Torubos was a funny mechanism, this whole disheckling, because on the one hand, he held participation and he held consensus, on the other hand, was off-putting and was yet another tool uh, to shut down unpopular opinions and to encourage a certain amount of conformity. A bit like the vote by show of hands. It was this kind of weird mix uh, of participation, responsible voting, dialectical deliberative exchange towards consensus, but at the same time, uh, a tool for conformity and for shutting down voices that were too much in disagreement or were too independent in a way. So there was some good and some bad. People would find it unpalatable today, but it was a key tool of how the Athenians made decisions. So if you want to imagine how the Athenians made decisions in the assembly and how an assembly would go, you've got to imagine something like this. There would be a speaker speaking very loudly but it wouldn't just him speaking and people sitting down like in a theater in the dark or something. People would talk back, would shout. It was an exchange. It was a dialogical kind of thing. Uh, the demos was this organic, uh, uh, active, noisy, opinionated whole that was supposed to come to a, to a communal decision together and acted in an institutional setup that was meant to foster that. And now I come to my conclusion and I go back a bit about what were the reasons for this kind of setup, for this institutional setup and this particular etiquette and these discursive rules, and what were some perks that we should do well to not imitate, but at least take into account as a foil to see some of the limitations of our own democratic systems. Now, first of all, this these attention to consensus was very important for, uh, in, a, in, a, in a context like Athens and like most Greek polis, in which there was no police, no standing army, no real means for the state to enforce decision through coercion. What is decided has to be done by everybody because otherwise somebody gets arrested or the police puts you in jail or whatever, well, there wasn't much of an option in Athens, which means that in order for a decision of the assembly to be actually enacted, to be put into action, and uh, for the people to act on it properly, it was necessary that a real, a significant amount of support must have been behind this decision. Otherwise, whatever you approve with 50% plus one, is likely the other 50% minus one would ignore the next day. 
or they might say, I wasn't on the assembly, or they might say, well, I didn't agree with that anyway. But if everybody agrees, then it's the demos that has decided something, and it's got a different kind of force. So this problem of getting everybody on board for a decision to be tenable is connected to the centrality of the value of homonoia, which we can translate with same-mindedness or consensus or harmony. But it is this notion of same-mindedness, of being of the same mind. Homonoia was fundamental to democratic ideology in Athens and beyond. And it was fundamental because the Greeks were terrified of stasis, of civil strife. They were terrified uh, of civil strife precisely because uh, in a context in which the possibility of co possibilities for coercion were quite limited, uh, irreconcilable and repeated disagreements could undermine and ultimately destroy the very integrity of the community. And here it's interesting because, as Jenny Mansbridge, the political theorist I already cited, says, voting symbolizes, reinforces, and institutionalizes division. Voting produces a result that excludes the minority by definition, while a decision by consensus includes everyone, reinforcing the unity of the group. In a, in a context in which the Athenians were so scared of division of civil strife, then, as Paul Carter has written, every vote on a major policy issue threatened the outbreak of stasis, of civil strife. It was because of this inherent danger of the division of a split vote turning into the division of civil war that the governing political idea on both sides of the political divide, democrats and oligarchs, was always homonoia, consensus, same-mindedness. And this is why the whole democratic system, although it allowed for division, it allowed for different opinions to be expressed and negotiated, and in extreme cases also allowed for split votes decided by majority, that's why it didn't favor this kind of solution. And it preferred instead to reach a consensus through sustained discourse, sustained deliberation, Basically, the idea was that the Athenians would keep talking and talking and talking until they came to an agreement. And that was the best way to make decisions that could have everybody on board and at the same time avoid civil strife and make sure that everybody would act upon them and feel included. That way the community would remain, uh, would maintain its integrity and the city's standing and the social harmony of the police would not be endangered at every new policy issue. So this was the model, and I tried to give you an idea of how it worked, how Athens worked, and also to make you aware of the fact that although we talk about our modern systems as democracies, and we talk about ancient Athens as a democracy, we are in fact talking about very different political systems, very different in many respects. The level of participation, the directness, as opposed to the representative nature of our system, and of course also this focus on consensus and the deliberative nature of Athenian democracy, which is very different from our adversarial systems, in which we divide in the middle and we hope everything will go all right afterwards, as we've seen in recent years. So make with this as you wish. Athens is not a model to imitate, but it can be something good to think with. By thinking about the differences between that system and our own, we can get uh, a better idea of what is inevitable, what is good about our system, what is not that good, the pitfalls of our system, and we can uh, get rid of this notion that the way things are, the way things are set up in our democratic system, it's the only way they can be set up. We can think of better ways, we can think of different ways, we can rethink parts of our political systems if they don't work to our end or the way we want them to work. So that's me for, for this video. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.